Good morning. And welcome to worship this morning. We want to welcome all of those who are listening in on our website or YouTube or on the radio or in public access TV. We are all gathered together in the name of our Lord. Um, just a couple of announcements I, uh, to let you know. This Wednesday, we will continue with our noon luncheon uh, where we get together at 1130 for a soup luncheon and fellowship time and a little discussion. That is the last one for Lent, and then, then we're done with that. The Wednesday evening program will meet at 5.30 with dinner, and this uh, time we're going to be enjoying chicken a la king <laughs> and salad. That sounds extremely good. And um, that dinner, and you're all invited, and then we're going to have our uh, programs that evening, with the kids in the fellowship hall, the adults into the um, lounge where we'll be doing the last in the series of the third day. The following Wednesday, we don't have any evening program. It commences again the following week. So the week of Holy Week, the 27th, there is no programming here at the church. On Friday, we'll be celebrating Good Friday with a service at 1 p.m. Now this is a service that's going to be uh, basically a combination of Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. So we'll begin at the, at the Last Supper where we'll enjoy communion together around the table and then we will make our way forward through the story until we stand at the foot of the cross with the dying Christ before us, as is traditional on Good Friday. So that will be a recorded service. If you're working and you'd like to watch it, it'll be available on our website and on YouTube on the channel that's under my name. Now, that following week after Easter, when we begin again with our Wednesday programming, it'll be just the same, 5.30 with dinner, uh, afterwards, there will be a program for the kids, and we'll be starting a new program that I'll be leading called The Problem of Jesus. This is a book that uh, is about answering a skeptic's challenges to the scandal of Jesus. We may not think of Jesus as being scandalous, but he most surely was. The scripture's testimony concerning Jesus was he was a scandalous person in his day to many of the people in power and is still today. Now, I had some really good news on this. Uh, that, that's why I have it up here. These are, when I bought this one, it was $15. But I went on Amazon and they're selling them for $5. I, I don't ask me why. So I ordered a bunch of them. I think I got five or six or seven of them coming. So if you'd like to have a copy of this, I'll have one here for you at church. Um, or if you want to get your own, you are welcome to Mark Clark. Mark Clark is the author of this, The Problem of Jesus. And we'll be using this for the, until May 1st, that's the last of those Wednesdays on May 1st, and then I'll be returning to this in the fall, because there's, this has nine sessions, but there's two uh, parts to each session, so there's, there's plenty of information in there for us to use. So I just wanted to put that in your mind. Another one I've been asked to remind you of, and you see it in red in there, we've changed the date of the rummage sale. So the rummage sale that we're gonna be having here at the church will be held on Friday and Saturday, April 26th and 27th. The times are there. As soon as we complete uh, Easter, so in a couple weeks, if you have items you'd like to donate for the garage sale, you can start bringing them if you wish at that time. Uh, we just, I, I just thinking it's easier if you wait till after Easter because there's so much going on around here. But uh, so start doing what you do and I do. Look through your, your items in the house that you might want to donate to our, our rummage sale and uh, then we'll be happy to have you uh, participate. And then lastly, on Easter Sunday, there is an Easter breakfast that's at 9 a.m. We're still looking for two people to make uh, some kind of a breakfast, you know, those breakfast uh, quiche kind of thing like that. Uh, we're looking for two more people. We've got, I think, three or so sign up or four, and we just need two more, and we'll have all that we need. So if you're, there's a sign-up sheet back in the fellowship hall right on the counter as you look into the kitchen. And so we'd invite you to consider that. Uh, other announcements, just go ahead and take a look in there. I'm not thinking of any others that I needed to, to highlight for you this morning, but uh, we're glad you're here with us. Our call to worship today is something that I think probably fairly familiar to us. So, but I'm going to ask you to recite this with me. The Apostles' Creed is, is the, the tradition, which isn't accurate, says that the, each of the apostles contributed a piece to this. Well, that's not true. It was written after their life. But nonetheless, the idea is, is beautiful. But the Apostles' Creed is different than the Nicene Creed. The Apostles' Creed was designed 
not to say what is not acceptable doctrine, much of Nicene Creed is, but what is the doctrine of the church, and that's the Apostles' Creed. So if you would join me in the re reciting this. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So that sums up the basic understanding of Christianity for the church for 2,000 years. And, you know, the Catholic means universal. That's why it's a small C instead of a capital C. But I, I just want to call one thing to your attention. Now, you notice the first section dealt with God the Father, God the Son. All we got for the Holy Spirit is, I believe in the Holy Spirit. The reason that that is so is, is at the time that this was put together, they had not developed the doctrine of the Holy Spirit as yet. So we believe in the Holy Spirit, but by that point, they hadn't developed a doctrine so that you know why you don't have a whole phrase. Anyway, thank you for that. And now we've got a few songs. These are relatively short, so, but these are hymns of praise. Now, we've added on the bottom now, you'll see on the slides, please stand if comfortable doing so. Some folks have said, we don't know when to stand and sit, you know. Um, so if you'd like to stand, if you're comfortable standing where you see this, then, and, or in your bulletin, you're invited to do so. So if you'll stand and join with me in singing these songs.
like on a hiking trail, right? Or in school, maybe you line up in your classroom to walk to another room or to walk down the hall to the lunchroom. Or how about a band and everybody's playing instruments in a band? Do they follow somebody? What, who do they follow? They follow the band director? And if they don't, there's kind of a problem, isn't there? It doesn't sound so good. Well. These are examples of following, but these people that I'm just talking about, they didn't have to give anything up. And when you got in your car this morning to come to church, you knew that when you went home, your clothes would be there, your toys would be there, your food would be there, your blankets, your house, right? It's a Okay, Every, everything's going to be there when you go back, right? Well, we're going to talk about some people in Jesus' time. They're called disciples. And these were faithful men that followed Jesus. And they helped him teach people about God. They helped him when they fed people. They helped Jesus when he went out and healed people, and he helped, they helped when people were sad, and Jesus was telling people about God's love. These guys were fishermen. Uh, did, did you ever go fishing? Okay. On a boat. Ava, do you want to open up the book to, the, to the, where the marker is, please? And you and Caden can look at that picture. There, there's the picture. Just look at that picture. Whoops, where the marker is. That a girl. Ooh. guess what? Jesus showed up at the lake, and he goes, follow me. And he asked those men to come follow them. And do you know what those men did? They left their boats. They left their families. They left their friends. They left their clothes. They left their house. They left their food. Everything and they followed Jesus. They wanted to be Jesus' servants and help him. And they promised to follow Jesus wherever they went. These guys had some interesting names. You wanna know the names of those, those guys? Before I tell you their, their names, now I need, I need the, Thank 
Because there were 12 of these men that went with Jesus. You can close your hand around them, Ava. You can keep those. You can keep them if you want to, or you can put them in the box in the back where our offering goes sometimes if you want to after church. Okay? Okay, now I'm going to tell you the names. These guys were called what? Disciples? Yeah. Yes. All right, see if, you, see if you know anybody. Come on. With these names, okay? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the names. There was Peter the Rock. Do you know any Peters? There was James. There was Andrew. There was Philip. There was. I'm glad this wasn't my name. Bartholomew. That's a big one to to spell. There was Matthew. Do you know any Matthews? No. no? Okay. Do you know any Thomases? Nope. Okay. There was another James. This is another big one. There was a Thaddeus, and there was a Simon, and there was a Judas. So there were 12 pennies, should be 12 pennies, and there were 12 faithful followers of Jesus. Well, do you think you can be a follower of Jesus? You are correct. There can be a Caden that follows Jesus. There can be an Ava that follows Jesus. There can be a grandma, Pat, and a grandpa, Ken, that follows Jesus. There could be a pastor, Dave, that follows Jesus. And lots more people out there to follow Jesus. And you know what? We have to give up some things sometimes to follow Jesus, but we do it because Jesus first loved us, and he asks us to follow him and obey his teachings. Do you think we can follow him? It makes Jesus happy when we do. How about if we pray about that for a minute, okay? Dear Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we can learn about you, and thank you that we can follow you and love you with our whole hearts. And thank you, Jesus, for loving us first and for dying on the cross for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today our, our uh, choir isn't with us, so we're going to be the choir, and we have parts of these songs. It's not terribly long, but do remain seated as we sing.
Scripture this morning is from Matthew 10, verses 1 through 15, the New Revised Standard Version. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority for un over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 disciples again. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaan, Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed them. The mission of the twelve. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not take a road leading to Gentiles and do not enter a Sumerian town, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with a skin disease. Cast out dim de demons, you received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it, but if it's not worthy, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come and the same. Let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dual from your feet the dirt from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. So in the reading from Matthew, 
this morning, we find the first time in Matthew where all the disciples are named and they are given their commission as apostles. They're sent out into the world for a specific purpose, a purpose or their mission, you could say, which is different for the apostles than it is for the church that followed in some ways. You notice when Jesus described the things he called on them to do, they were the very things he himself had been doing. And so they're sent into the world to take the kingdom message out into the world and do these miraculous things. And there were many miracles associated with the disciples or the apostles in that regard. Now, missions are kind of important, you know, and I remember back when I first started in 1990, it was a year where the church was really pushing the idea of getting a local mission statement. Every church was asked, if they didn't already have one, to write a mission statement. Now, later they'd say, we also should have a vision statement, but the mission statement was really the thing, and we were expected to have it and be able to show it to our district superintendents that all of us pastors had complied. So people got together and they wrote their mission statements. This church has one, it's on that big sign as you go out your door there in the fellowship hall to the right. It used to be printed in the bulletin, so I was gonna read that and I didn't notice it isn't, sadly. But, but you can read that. And our mission statement I think is wonderful. I've done sermon series on it, it really is a great one. The United Methodist Church has a mission statement too. Uh, you know, it has this, it's a go, it is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The problem I've always had with that is what are we transforming it from and to what? So I, I think it's a little open-ended for my taste, but, but that is our mission statement. That's more like a vision statement, but, but we have a mission statement. So we have them at, the, at the, the, you know, the world level as well. Jesus gave the church a commission and he said, go therefore into the world making disciples of me teaching them everything that I have taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he had a mission statement for us all. He also said, you're to love God with all that you are and your neighbor as yourself. Those are our mission statements as community. But have you ever thought about, should you have a mission statement for yourself? Well, I certainly never did. And then I did this doctoral program where they said, well, we want you to write a personal mission statement. I thought, how in the world are you going to do that? we got all kinds of mission statements out there, you know? And, but we were to take it very seriously, and I did. I, I sat down and I thought, well, you know, I'm a pastor in the church, but, but that's my job as well. You know, kind of, a mission sort of goes with your work, doesn't it? And they said, personal. What do you see yourself at this moment in, in, as a Christian person in the world? What is the pur purpose of your being what is your purposeful heart? So I wrote one, and I'm going to read it to you today. I only shared it with them, but, but, uh, but I will share it with you. And this statement I wrote as I thought a lot about this subject. Here's how mine goes. It is my mission to be a companion on the journey of life with those who, like me, seek to be disciple of Jesus Christ. In this, I will at times be leading and at times following but always side to side with my sister and brother in Christ. I want to experience Jesus' promise of abundant living. Therefore, I will take care of myself as best as I am able and to live in harmony and in peace with those around me, caring for others while allowing others to care for me as well. I want to see and appreciate as much of the beauty of this world as I can, knowing that I, like all of humankind, are its stewards. So that's what I wrote and turned into them. And, and now it, it set me thinking about the passage of scripture today. You know, rather than just have it as an exercise, no matter how seriously I took this, an exercise we do in order to satisfy some academic requirements, what if we all sat down and gave some thought to this? Now, having a purpose in life, you know, when, when we talk to human beings about what they really care about, what really matters, not just what they want, but what they need, people frequently say, I need to be needed. And that's another way of saying, I need to have a purpose. Nobody wants to live a life without a purpose. 
And sometimes as we get older and we get more limited, some people have said to me, I really have no purpose in life anymore. That's not true. Absolutely not. Your purpose in life isn't always dictated by your physical ability in any means at all. Your purpose in life can be a, to be a loving and caring person, someone who prays for others. Is that not a very wonderful purpose to have in life? Your purpose in life might be to share what you have enjoyed and gained over the, the lifetime and experience and perhaps phys, um, financial ability or whatever it is, knowledge. That, is that a bad purpose to have? Not at all. Our purpose in life should mean something to us that is also meaningful to those to whom we wish to receive it. Now, I wouldn't recommend a purpose in life, but I've heard people had this, my, and some people in our society do. My purpose in life is to get as much as I can, as much as I can get for myself, so I can live the good life. You see, a Christian purpose as is not focused specifically on the individual, but the individual in community with others. So Jesus never said, you know what? Your purpose in life is just to get by. Just keep your head down. Just to make it. Because you know, if you stick your head up too high, somebody's liable to try to take it off for you, metaphysically or metaphorically speaking rather. You know, we, are, are, do you have a sense of purpose in living? Some people have come to see psychologists, and the psychologist will talk to them about how they see their own life, and they would see the life as not really mattering much. Oh, I'm not, nobody cares about me. You know, nobody's interested in me. I have nothing to give anymore. And, and it's an aspect of depression. Depression will lead us to that place where we think that, you know what, nobody, nobody even knows I exist. And that's a difficult thing to deal with in psychology. Well, you can work on that, of course. You can, people build up images and ideas that, you know, you can talk through and they can talk through and you can help them figure that out. But, but see, in our Christian faith, that argument really holds no water because God cares about you. And, and if, if, if you're talking to a Christian psychologist, they will tell you that. Even if you do not see yourself of value, know there is a God that does and has a purpose for you in this life. Even if your family doesn't or your society doesn't or whatever, you feel there's no specific purpose for you, God most surely does have a purpose for you, and it may be as simple as praying or simple as being kind, being that voice that someone needs to hear. I knew somebody one time that went around collecting stories uh, you know, about people. He, he just loved to have stories about people, and they're really good at that, storytellers. I, I really admire their ability to do it. And, and he would talk to people, and I just had a conversation with him. I didn't know him very well. It was in one of these things. I was at a seminar or something. Like that. But he liked to collect stories, <coughs> and he'd share them. And one of the stories he used to share with me, and I try to remember in my head all the time, is that he would make a concerted effort to talk to the people that checked out groceries. You remember the days when you didn't have to do it for yourself? Okay, well, we still can have others do it, but, but in the days when everybody had to have somebody that would check you out, you know, run the cash register, scan, whatever they were doing. Those days, of course, they had to go, you know, and, and he would ask them, how, are, how is your day going for you? Things like that, to get a conversation going, because you have a few minutes, you know? And this was his thing, and he would have people that would be very happy and people that were very not happy, people that were friendly, people were not friendly. But one of the things that stuck in my mind is, is that they were absolutely shocked that he asked them how they were doing. Then I got thinking about it. How do I check out? I, I love to check myself out, by the way. I, I, I see myself as some kind of, of a you know, star checker outer. I can do it quick, fast, and efficiently and get out of there as fast as I can. So I, I like that, but I know it. Uh, but anyway, but how often have I ever looked at the person checking out my groceries when I did and had any concern about them at all, other than I wish they went a little faster? 
So I get a little impatient and things like that. As Jackie will tell you, you know, when I go into the store, the favorite thing I want to hear her say is, now it's time to leave. Okay, that's me. I'm not a shopper. But, but it's funny. Uh, well, there's certain stores I could spend all day in, but we won't go there. But it's the, this idea, how have I looked upon that person or the waiter or waitress that serves at the table or the people that do for us, the people that pick up our garbage, even though it's all machine now. But in the day, these guys rode in the back and jumped off and grabbed that can and threw it in. It didn't matter if it was raining, snowing, sleeting, or boiling hot. I never once even really noticed them. Oh, there's a little kid to think it was cool when the garbage truck went by. What do we do when we encounter people in our lives that aren't our friends, our family, and maybe are doing something for us? You know, do we see them as people or do we see them as people that are doing a service? And that service better be good because we're consumers. And when we're consumers, by golly, if you don't please us, we'll consume somewhere else, right? I mean, we've been raised in that society to be consumers, to demand good service. And we're not particularly concerned about who the person is. We're more concerned about how they perform their job. Isn't that true? Don't give me good service at the table and don't expect a tip. Although it's almost all made it automated now. But nonetheless, right? Is that not how, do we, do, we, do we wonder about the person serving at the table, whether or not they have just dealt with the death of a family member? Or their boyfriend ran out on them? Or they just found out their husband was unfaithful? Or their wife? Have you ever wondered about that? This guy did, and he collected stories like that. So he's kind of haunted me in my life, you know, uh, and, and I'm not a talker. I, I'm not a big, you, I know that sounds strange to you, but I'm not a guy that strikes up conversation with people that I just meet, you know. I just, just not that way. Um, and, but, but this guy was, and he told me things, and that stuck with me all along. What if your purpose in life is just to smile and be nice to those people in life who serve our needs, to see them as people? Is that not a good purpose? What if you made that your purpose? Imagine the difference in how it would be when you went to a place like Walmart, not to give them advertisements, so we'll throw them pick and save and the Econo or Marketplace now, just to be fair. What if you made it your mission when you went in there and you were going to wish them a good morning and actually mean it? How often has someone said, well, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. Do you ever really wonder if they're fine? Are you always fine when you say I'm fine? They say that if you go beyond that. In fact, there's a psychological thing that I read one time about that and it, years ago. And they said you need to ask actually about three times before someone will actually tell you if they're fine or not. Are you fine? I'm fine. Are you really fine? I'm fine. Are you really fine? Well, now that you mention it. <laughs> that stood out through tests. So this fellow wanted to know, what if you're, you decided that your personal mission in life is going to be to be a, a person that really decides in their life that you're going to take Christianity seriously. Now, of course, I'm a pastor. I believe in that, right? But what if you say, no, no, you know, I, I'm really going to take it seriously now. Not just a Sunday morning thing. Not just a, when I'm talking to mom or dad, you know, and they're wondering how I'm doing, you know. And they're wondering about church or something. Yeah, you know, to satisfy the grandparents is what I like to call it. What, what if you really take it seriously and you say, I am going to reflect on in my life, my mission, my personal mission for, say, I don't know, a period of time, is to reflect on who I am before God. After all, you know, that's what Lent's for, just not to give away something, but Lent's all about that. But let's say, even if it's what's left from now to, to Easter, I'm going to give a week, basically, and I'm going to look at my life in light of what it means to be a Christian. We just did the Apostles' Creed. And I'm going to look at my life, and I'm going to say to myself, is this really something that I hold on to? Is this really what I believe? I mean, really? I got to say it three times. Really? 
Because, you know, we start out by saying, I believe in God, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in that? You know, I, I, you, when, when the Webb telescope went up there, I thought I was, Hubble had me, my mind blown. I was an amateur astronomer when I was a kid, and it just blew my mind. Webb has actually talked, and, and not just blew my mind, but made it go kaboom, boom, boom, boom. You look at some of those, you cannot look at what's out there in the heavens, the beauty, the absolute beauty, and not say to yourself, oh my God. Now I'm going to tell you why. It isn't because of science. I can tell you how those things form, by the way, and you probably don't want to know, but how novas work and supernovas and how stars form. I had astrophysics. I love this stuff. Uh, but, but I know scientifically how it all happened. But does it have to be beautiful? No. How do I know it's beautiful? What particular aspect of uh, causing me to, uh, to evolve, some think I should evolve more, but to evolve that I need to have beauty for, looking at these enormous and incredible sights in the sky? None. There's no evolutionary benefit to beauty. Did you know that? The only thing about, and you might say, well, uh, uh, evolutionary theory talks about beauty being, you know, because men are attracted to women who are beautiful, you know, and that's to, that's to, and women to men who are big and, you know, good looking. And that promotes the, the uh, you know, having children. Oh, really? Well, actually, there's this little part of your brain right back here that drives all that. Our concepts of beauty are, are unique to culture. It's a cultural thing not an evolutionary thing. The evolutionary thing has to do with what we see, but it's much more basic than what appears to be beautiful. It actually is, is it's something back in the, in the very uh, primitive part of our brain, as they call it, that, that causes us to see certain aspects of shape and so forth that implies to us fertility. That sounds stupid, doesn't it? It's very scientific. Beauty is a gift of God, and there's no other way to explain it. You've seen sunsets and sunrises around this place. I know that have absolutely made you go, oh, my God, even if those weren't your exact words. Can you think of a single thing about what the sun said, other than red sky at night, sailor's delight, red sky it's morning, sailor take warning? Just beauty is a gift of God. What if your personal mission, and I'll wrap up with this one, from now until the end of, of uh, to Easter, is to look in the world for something that's beautiful and thank God for it? Is that a bad one? Just, just a child. You saw beauty sitting here in front of you this morning, and it just absolutely, I think it's wonderful. What if you go into the world for the next few days and you say, my personal mission is, and you select something for yourself and say, I'm going to try to do that. And I'm going to do that because you know what? We have a purpose. We matter. And so does every other person you're going to run into. Every other person from the, the, the you know, I wish I could always say the cash register person now, but they're getting fewer and fewer, you know. I just argue with the machine, which is really silly, but I do it anyway. I always thank them, by the way, in the store when I'm checking out for myself. I thank them for letting me work for them for no pay. I, I drive my wife crazy. Yes, she's back there going like this because I drive her nuts. But, but no, look for that opportunity or look for some beauty. Have you noticed the buds starting to set on the trees? Have you noticed the robins start showing up? What if your purpose for just a while is to look for the beauty that God has blessed you and I with in this world? Isn't that a good purpose? You see, there's a multitude of them. And I just want to encourage you to think about that. Uh, and you don't have to write it out like I did, you know. But I mean, give it a try. And see if it doesn't enhance your Lenten experience. I pray that it does. Because every one of you, every one of us, has a purpose. And what we need to do is make that purpose part of our heart. Part of who we are. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. This hymn is Take Up Thy Cross, 415.
So as always, I invite you to look in your bulletin and see the concerns that are listed there and the people we ask or have been asked to pray for. So I invite you to do that uh, as you have opportunity. At this moment though, let's just let flowing our hearts and minds, what are joys in our lives or what are concerns? And then just in a moment, I'll pray a prayer. May we pray together. Merciful and loving God, we gather in this place today to offer words of gratitude to pray requests that you would show us how to live and how to live in a righteous way in this world, following after your son Jesus as best as we're able. We gather to share singing together as uh, songs of faith and to just be together as well and to speak the scripture and hear about the scripture and think about how we might live the scripture. So we thank you, God, that we can be together and that you bless us with this opportunity. And we ask, oh God, that you would look to those who are in need this day, those who we give thought to, or perhaps those rejoicing, and, and let them know, Lord, of your love, your love that is an aspect of your grace. We lift these folks before you, even now as we pray our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in... God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below, praise him above ye heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy this day and in every day may you know the love of God in his name amen our closing hymn is he leadeth me O blessed thought 128 and it'll be on the screen